<laughs> um, I have a new guest today, and she was quite um, on my list um, to interview her. Um, she is an entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a mother, and everything compact, like packed together in one package. Um, I'm still not a mother and not married yet, so <laughs> the feeling that you have is um, is understandable. Um, first of all, before I can continue with the interview, maybe you can introduce yourself. Well, first of all, Salam alaikum and Jazakallah khair for inviting me on today. Um, my name is Jennifer Ogunyemi, and I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called Citizen Business. And it's one of the largest organizations that helps Muslim women to grow and start their businesses. Um, I'm a reaver of 20 years, alhamdulillah. Um, I'm also a mother to four children, my oldest being 20 and the youngest being six years old. Um, and just as you mentioned, you know, we wear all sorts of different hats, being a wife, being a sister, an auntie, a friend. So, yeah, uh, it's it it's such a beautiful but varied roles that we have subhanallah um but yeah this is who i am um and yeah a pleasure to be here with you today perfect um the first the, the thing is that i'm only asking the questions i'm not going to answer anything or discuss rarely about something so i'm just going to listen to you mm -hmm. how was your childhood <laughs> Um, okay, so Alhamdulillah for the first part of my childhood, it was absolutely amazing, stable family, um, you know, the typical mum, dad, siblings inside the family. Um, I'm the oldest of five in this country, but the third child from my mum and the firstborn from my dad. Um, but then it got to, I want to say I was 10, 10 that my family unit then broke down. So my parents got divorced. Um, and then, yeah, then life became a little bit more difficult. So then I started to um, experience things like childhood bullying. Um, my mum saying particular things to me about my weight, about the color of my skin. Um, and so that became quite intense. Um, went through the whole of school. Um, then I went through the whole of school being a bully. and. So it's really ironic the way that things happen. But, you know, I started off being bullied, then started to be a bully and then started to kind of find my feet in terms of being a teenager and understanding who I am and just being comfortable with the way that I look, with the way that, with the way that people perceive me. Um, and so, yeah, so then I then got to the age of 16. Then I was then kicked out of my parents' home and I was homeless for a year and that kind of like sums up my childhood as best as possible how's the relationship with your parents with my mum no relationship um there's no relationship whatsoever so I took Shahada at 18 and the relationship was a bit rocky even at that point but alhamdulillah um it came to a point seven years ago that she decided that she no longer wanted to ever be a part of my life, my children's life. So Alhamdulillah, that's not an existent. Me and my dad, on the other hand, um, we're so much more better. Um, he's more understanding now to to my way of life. He's much more understanding into the way that um, the way that us Muslims how we get married. And you know, I'm from a very I'm from West Africa, so our culture is completely different into the way that we do things. Um, and so, yeah, so Alhamdulillah, we're in a much better place than I would say maybe even four or five years ago. Um, so, yeah, Alhamdulillah, we're, we're getting there. How's the relationship with money? Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My relationship with money was absolutely terrible. It was absolutely terrible. It was terrible. Why? Because I was homeless at a point and I had no money. And so when I started to get money, I then began to hoard money. I began to keep money. Every single penny that I had, I began to keep it. I don't want to spend it out of the fear of never having it again. Um, so for a good couple of years, um, I would have money, not really spend it. Or if I did spend it, I would never spend it on myself. Um, and then the older I've got, the more children I've got, I've then understood the power in, in money just being a currency and not really being the thing that controls 
how I spend on what I spend. Um, so now, alhamdulillah, I, I'm one of those people that, um, that alhamdulillah, you know, we're very comfortable in what we have. We're earning money. The business is earning money. We're doing all of that. But I still have to remind myself that I do not need to hoard it. I can spend it and it will come back to me, inshallah. So, yeah, it's been a work in progress. It's been huge, huge work that I've had to do in terms of my mindset towards money or even just my views and perceptions of what money is and how it works for us has been huge, huge learnings. Um, but yeah, alhamdulillah, so much more better now, which means that, you know, I'm able to educate my children. I'm able to educate other sisters on what money actually is and how it's the best way I can put it is money just money is like energy. So the more the more you resist it, the more it won't come. But the more you open to it, the more it will come. Very hard to explain. But yeah, my relationship with money has definitely, definitely got better. But it's funny because I just used to hate money before. I used to hate it. What are you afraid of? What am I afraid of? Um... I'm afraid of those people who told me that I would never make it in proving them right. So I'm constantly making sure that I'm constantly working in proving people wrong because all I've ever been told is that I will never do the things that I want to do. Um, and my fear is maybe missing it and not, not succeeding at that thing and then them standing up and then saying to me, but we told you so that's a real big fear um and to just to give you an example my my son my first child I had him when I was really really young and so people said to me you'll never be able to do this you'll never be able to do that then I became Muslim and they said well now you're a young mom with young with a young boy in Britain and if you know the, the the climate of Britain right now a lot of knife crime and all of those things that are happening and they said you know he'll just be another statistic and he'll just be this and I remember when it came to GCSEs, when it came to high school and he got through his GCSEs, me and his dad high-fived each other because it was like, alhamdulillah, we've got through phase one. And now that he's in university, we're able to high-five each other and say, alhamdulillah, he passed his driving test. So it's these things that I constantly make sure that I chase and succeed at so that those people who doubted me or who told me that it would never be that I don't prove them right. I have to constantly be proving them wrong. If you are not afraid of anything, what would you do? If I weren't afraid of anything, what would I do? Honestly, what I would do? Can't tell you what I would do, honestly. But what I will tell you is that I would ensure that every woman who ever ever wanted to do or start something succeeds at what she does at no at, like with no barriers whatsoever so i would rule a country i would make the country in the way that i want it i will kick the people out that i don't want in it and i will be so firm in that in the sense that we would have our own village, right? And we would have our own ecosystem and we'll have our own currency and we'll do all of that just so that our communities can continue to thrive and be better than what we are now. I just love that. Mm -hmm. um, the two adding questions um, are directly about your business. So um, you are, let's say the CEO, of this is in business um how did you start with this and um is it hard for any woman to start a business so how did I start it started seven years ago six months pregnant with my last child <clears throat> I was in um the national health service I was working in national health service in the UK and I decided that I didn't want to go back after maternity um so I started another business and put all my savings in it thousands of pounds of savings um, my house looked like a warehouse because all the products and all the stock and all the branding and everything was there. And I launched it and it didn't do anything. And I was completely distraught. Like I was, I said to myself, but I've done everything that I possibly could to make this business what it is. 
And then I started to reflect and I said, okay, there's two things that's wrong with it. First of all, I didn't have business knowledge. I didn't have enough business knowledge to be able to start this business, launch it and allow it to grow. That's number one. Number two, when I was networking, I always found that there was a barrier between me and the person that I was in a networking room with. And that usually looked like me being the only hijabi in the room or the only Muslim in the room. So then I thought, this is an uncomfortable, my fitra and, you know, just it couldn't take being that, okay? Um, and so I decided that, okay, after weeks of crying and weeks of feeling sorry for myself, I decided that I was going to run an event. And this event was just going to be bringing sisters together who were like me, who wants a business, um, but is finding it very difficult in the landscape of business to just start. And I remember putting my first event out and nobody bought a ticket. I said to myself, this is over. Like, this is not supposed to be for me. Let me just go back to the nine to five and let me just live life according to the way that Allah probably wants me to live it. So then I, I sat again and I was just like, I was in, the, you know, when you're pregnant, you have so many emotions that overcome you. And those emotions was definitely taking its toll on me. So I said, okay, you know, let me look at the poster again. I took the poster down off Instagram. Um, and at that point, I think I already had like not even 100 followers, if I'm going to be honest, not even that. And I took the poster down and I said, you know, I'm going to rework the poster. So I looked at it and I looked at it from the perspective that if I was going to an event, what are the things that I would look for on a poster in order for me to say, yes, I want to go to this event. So I reworked the poster and I just said, Bismillah, let's do this again. Like if it if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, then great. So then um, I put the poster out and within two weeks, it was completely sold out. Then I thought to myself, oh, okay, well, let's just do the first event. I'm six months pregnant. Let's just see how it goes. And the first event, it absolutely blew my mind away that even I felt like I had an outer body experience where my body just lifted up above everything. And I saw and I couldn't believe that I done that. And so that went from one event to two, three, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 90. I think we've thrown over 100 events to date with sisters from all over the UK, all over the world. We even have sisters that came from Netherlands to come to our events. Um, so yeah, that's how we started, subhanAllah. And what do I think is the biggest issue when it comes to sisters owning or starting or having a business? I think the biggest issue is ourselves in not having enough confidence to say, I am able to do this because Allah has willed it for me. There's such a disconnect between those two things that even though as Muslims, we believe in the qadr of Allah and we understand that everything comes from Allah, rizq is from Allah, there's still a disconnect. And that disconnect comes from the lack of confidence that we have within ourselves. And so I would say that's the biggest barrier. The other thing to that is also understanding that we have come from generations. We have come from generations that has trauma when it comes to being a Muslim woman. So we've constantly been told that a Muslim woman should be doing this and not this. A Muslim woman should be doing that and not this. But then when we look at the stories of the mother, mothers of the believers or we look at the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu we understand that there are stories that exist within that that tells us otherwise. So it's it's been a journey of re-educating um, re the community in what we are able to do as Muslim women and what we're not able to do as Muslim women. And, you know, we are we do face to the fact that there are some things that as Muslim women that we shouldn't be partaking in. And that's a whole different story. But even if we take the mother of the, our, our first mother of the believer, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. She gave the wealth to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If she didn't have her wealth from her entrepreneurship, Islam would not be a wealthy religion. Mm. And so from this example alone, we understand that entrepreneurship has existed far long before us. And in fact, the confidence that the women had back then, when they had no faith whatsoever was even better than ours. So why is it that we lack confidence and faith in Allah, even though we have Islam as our faith? There's such two big disconnects. And so we have to recognize that this hasn't just come from overnight. It has come from generations 
of our mothers, of our sisters, of our, of our aunties, of the women of the village that's been told that you are less than because you are a Muslim. And so now that we are, for me, I'm first generation after my parents, I am now undoing that trauma for my own family and my own children. So now the next generation, inshallah, won't have that trauma as bad as what we have and it will just continue to get better. Beautiful. I love that. I love your answer. Um, the second question is, um, how did the business or the entrepreneurship you're doing impacted the how you raise your children? So the business that I have was from an impact of having my first daughter. So I have two boys first and two girls after. When I had my first daughter, which is my third child, I realized that if it came to a point that I wanted her to have inspiration from anyone, who is that inspiration? Mm. And then when I look at the educational system, us as West Africans, we have a very, very, very big um, view. Like our children must be educated. They must be educated. And alhamdulillah, I love that for us. But at the same time, how can I expect my children to be to be believers with the education system at the same time? Well, we can. My children can be, she can be an alima as well as being educated, as well as being a doctor, a midwife, and whatever it is that she wants to be. And so that this business, the first business that failed was from a direct impact of understanding that one day she's going to be her own woman. What does she have to inspire, motivate, or even just look at to be like that person that was number one number two sisters in business itself impacts the way that i raise my children why because now they understand that there are many muslim women who look like them that are in places of visibility that are only businesses that are running businesses they come to my events they see the speakers they see the people that i talk to and all of them look like me in a sense that we are all muslim women so now it's not going to be foreign. The way that it was foreign for me to be in a room and be the only Muslim in the room, it will no longer be foreign for them because they understand that before them, they saw women doing this. So now why in, you know, it's like that is the best example I can give is like, you want to buy a white car and all of a sudden you're seeing white cars everywhere, right? The, 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 the scientific, That's true. The, the <laughs> thing in your brain has just picked up the fact that now there's white cars everywhere and there probably isn't any more white cars than what you usually saw. But because now you're conscious of it, you see mm. a lot more of it. It's the exact same thing for my children. So when my children go to school and they proudly tell their teachers, my mum does this or my mum is in this part of the world because she's doing this or my mum is, you know, on TV or doing these things they are proud to say it not because i'm just their mum but because they understand that being a muslim woman is much more than just being a mother a wife at home it means that you can have aspirations you can have dreams you can have the things that you ask allah for and it happened to you in this dunya because for the akira is what you're preparing for so it, 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 like, there's a big, big bubble that I have around it that I use to protect my children, mm. especially my girls, um, because I never want them to feel like they are less than anybody else just because of the faith that they follow. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, I love this. Um, I, still, I still keep saying it. Um, I'm repeating my, my answer. But how I love the uh, about how I love your answers um, regarding the questions. Um, we're done with the um, questions regarding your business. Mm -hmm. I'm back to the direct questions. Mm -hmm. um, if money is guaranteed for life for you and your family and your generation after you, but the condition is you have to choose a job, what would it be? What would it be? It would be what I'm doing now. It would be what I'm doing now. If I had to do this for life, which by the way, I am prepared to do it for life, like the exit strategy is to pass this on to my children. It isn't to sell it to anyone else. It's for it to be passed on to the children so they can continue to do the work in the community. It would be this for many reasons. Number one, being a revert, I, Allah gave me a whole new community when he knew that I needed community. 
when I was kicked out of home and 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 um and shunned from the community that I was from, which is the Christian community, Allah gave me a whole new community that I then called my family. So first of all, I owe a lot to community. The second thing to that is that, you know, sometimes you just have a call in and you have to give in to the fact that this is what Allah is calling you to. Now, it doesn't mean that there has never been moments where I don't want to give up. There ha- it doesn't mean that there's never been moments where I doubt myself. It doesn't mean there's never been moments where I ask myself, actually, why am I doing what I'm doing? The fact is, and the bottom line is, is that this is what Allah has called me to do. And it means that that sometimes the calling that we have is a long term calling rather than a short term calling. And I have to answer to that because Allah gave me a whole new life when I took Shahada. So, again, it all comes back down to my experience of losing something and then Allah replacing it with something better. I lost the previous business to this. I now have this business. In a million years, did I not think that doing this would give me financial freedom, financial independence, or even help others have financial independence from the things that they love to do. So if it means that I have to sit in front of a camera for hours and hours on end, or if it means that I have to, you know, do content for like seven days a week for the rest of my life, then alhamdulillah, I'm happy to do so because I know that I'm just not impacting myself. But I'm also impacting generations to come. This for me is Sadaqa Jiriya. This for me is like a luxury. Yes, I understand we get paid from it, and I understand that you know we have an income from it. But the everlasting legacy in which I'm trying to leave is what will make this a long life job for myself. You're the, actually the first one who said "salaq um, al I interview many Muslims, and and non-Muslims too. But um, it's very interesting that you um, combined your job with "salaq al very very interesting um miss jennifer in one word we'll say that sorry again miss jennifer in one word miss jennifer what does that mean describe me yourself in one word ah, describe me oh okay authentic if you have your own heart in your hands what would you advise it To never be afraid. What's the best moment in your life? The best moment in my life. There's many. Um, but the best moment in my life is realizing that what I do, no one else can do it the way that I do it. And that's the best feeling ever. I can talk about materialistic things. I think the world has had enough of people hearing 10K marks, 20K marks. We've had enough of that. The best moment is understanding that I'm actually living in the legacy that I thought I was going to leave behind. I'm living in it now. And that is the best feeling that anyone could ever have. Because then you truly understand the value in which you're imparting in the work that you do. Any regrets? My biggest regret is at the moment when I said I couldn't and it stopped me from doing some things. What makes you you? What makes me me? my journey um the fact that i am transparent and authentic in the things that i say and how i do things um and you know what else makes me me the fact that people misunderstand who i am the fact that some people will see me and think oh my gosh she's so mean or i can be so direct in the way that i speak that people think oh my god she's so mean but with that directness there's so much love And there's so much wisdom that comes with that. And um, yeah, without that, believe me, I wouldn't be who I am. We're done. Jazakallah khair. I don't know if you want to say something. If not, we can end the recording. 
it's completely down to you alhamdulillah you've asked me the questions mashallah <laughs> i've answered them um jazakallah khair for having me um jazakallah khair for your sabr um and may allah bless you in in even reaching out to me um it's been an absolute pleasure being on here with you thank you